Minglaba, welcome to the second uh, of the four lecture series on dermatology. It's our great pleasure to um, have Professor Gemma Malerio from Guy's and St. Thomas's and King's College London. So Professor Malerio is chief at uh, St. John's Institute of Dermatology at Guy's and St. Thomas's. And also she has a wide ranging uh, interest, special interest in pediatric dermatology, all aspects of pediatric dermatology, including uh, genodermatoses. And she was one of my great uh, PhD supervisors. Um, she is going to talk to you about common and emergency skin disease in children today. And thank you so much, Gemma, for giving up your time on a Sunday morning. Very welcome. Thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfectly. Gemma, what I'll do is, um, so um, there, there will be plenty of questions in the chat and I'll try to address them um, if they're quite straightforward by providing links and various information. And then at the end of it, we'll get on to Q&A session. Great. Thanks, Gemma. Well, the floor is yours. Perfect. I'll share my screen, hopefully. How's that looking? Can you see what we've got there? Perfect. Splendid. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, afternoon for you, but uh, welcome from a very grey and sort of miserable looking London um, here. So as Sue said, I'm going to talk about some common and emergency uh, skin conditions in children. And I know that Professor Griffiths gave you a, a talk last week, I think it was, uh, about some issues in adults and has gone through um, some basics about sort of taking a dermatology history and, and uh, some basic dermatology. So hopefully what we're going to talk about is to build on that today. Now, obviously, the whole subject of paediatric dermatology is very, very broad. Um, and, you know, people write big fat textbooks about it. So we're going to have to sort of focus on what we talk about today. And a lot of the conditions we see in children might be something that present in adults, but there are a lot of things that are just unique to paediatric dermatology. So a lot of inflammatory conditions and infections you might see in adults and children. There are some autoimmune diseases as well that can occur across different ages. But in children in particular, birthmarks uh, are a very important thing to recognize and to know how to deal with. And also a lot of genetic conditions that affect the skin present in children, or in children often in neonates. So that's something else to be aware of. And there are lots of other things, developmental things, lumps and bumps that are particularly prevalent in children. And so what I'm going to do over the next 50, 60 minutes is just to focus on some of the more common uh, disorders uh, and how to manage them. So I'm going to talk quite a lot about atopic eczema and the reason is that this is a very common thing in children and it's important to get this right because it really is one of the bread and butter things that you'll see when you're dealing with skin disease in children. Uh, in western countries we know that up to 20% of children will develop atopic dermatitis at some time, slightly less in other populations around the world. And it's a condition that often presents early on in life, but it can come later on during childhood or even in adulthood. But the typical baby that you'll get with eczema will often present with eczema affecting the head and the neck. And over time, it tends to progress on and become more flexural typically. So you can see the redness and uh, dryness involvement of the skin in the flexures there. And this is an older child with eczema. He's got very generalized atopic eczema. You can see it's affecting all of the face. His eyelids are sort of slightly swollen and in inflamed all over the trunk. And you see these poorly uh, defined patches of erythema with some excoriations in it. It's so typical of this condition. Again, some flexural involvement there. And you can see there's an accentuation of the skin markings and those elbow creases and on the right around the backs of the knees and all over the trunk. And this is what we call lichenification. And this is where the skin becomes thickened as a result of the sort of constant rubbing and scratching because eczema is such an intensely itchy condition. And often in darker skin types, that lichenification is quite marked that so you can see there on the left. And often it'll leave behind some post-inflammatory hyperpigmentations. The skin becomes darker where it's been inflamed with the eczema 
And this little boy in the middle shows a sign that's very typical for eczema, and that is that you get spurring of the tip of the nose. So even if you've got very extensive eczema, the nose is a site that tends to be spared. And the other thing that you may see in darker skin types, we can see on the right here, which is more follicular accentuation, what we call follicular eczema, which is just a different presentation that often you see in darker skin types. Now, sometimes babies will present with what's called seborrheic eczema. And this is a kind of dermatitis or eczema of the skin that often you have little malassezia yeasts involved in. And so typically what you get is some yellowy scaling and crusts on the head and neck. So around the eyebrows, on the scalp very typically, this is sometimes called cradle cap, and around the backs of the ears, so seborrheic dermatitis. So this will respond to your usual eczema treatments, but sometimes with a little anti-yeast treatment, um, meconazole or something like that, that will help reduce the yeast and help settle the inflammation more quickly. Discoid eczema seems to confuse people a lot because often they'll misdiagnose it as a, as a fungal infection of the skin, but it's actually little intensely inflamed patches of eczema and some children do develop this as their pattern of eczema rather than getting it in the folds of the skin. They develop these discoid or numular patches, these round patches that are intensely inflamed, very itchy, and are often secondarily infected with, with staphylococci. So sometimes using uh, something with topical with an anti-staphylococcal activity will help settle them down. But really you often need to use slightly more potent steroid on these areas to get them to settle. In terms of treatment of eczema, you really need to choose your treatment depending on the severity of the eczema and how it's responding. And you might need to use different things for different areas of the body depending on where which sites are affected. And it's really important to make sure that parents of children with eczema recognize when it's flaring so that they can step up the treatment when it's needed. And when things improve, they can step down. And I think it's really important to try and come up with a regimen for treatment that gets the most benefit you can, but with a minimum amount of effort. And really treating eczema is a bit like a recipe, a very simple recipe for making a cake because it's only got two main kinds of ingredients and either on their own won't do it. You really need the combination of the two ingredients to be able to switch that eczema off. So the first ingredient is an emollient, something to improve the barrier of the skin and help water retention in the skin. And the second is something anti-inflammatory, a fire extinguisher for the redness and the irritation that you've got, something anti-inflammatory. And here really we're talking about a topical steroid or a calcineurin inhibitor. So you really need emollient plus anti-inflammatory and that's the way you're gonna switch it off. If you just use an emollient, it won't treat the inflammation. If you just use a topical steroid, say, it's not gonna solve the barrier problem. So what we tend to do is stepped treatment. So for mild eczema, we would think about an emollient and a mild topical steroid. For more involved eczema, you would add to your emollient a moderate steroid, perhaps a calcineurin inhibitor. Sometimes we use therapy with bandages just to intensify the treatment. And for more severe disease, your emollient is there, that's basic, a potent topical steroid, a calcineurin inhibitor, you might use bandages, but in this minority of children who have more severe involvement, you would perhaps think about phototherapy or systemic therapy with something like methotrexate, for example. Now, just a word about emollients. There are lots of different types of emollients. And at one end, you've got your lotions as a couple of examples there. So lotions are quite thin and uh, fine, so not brilliant moisturizers um, for very dry skin. The next step, would be a cream, which is a bit thicker and a bit richer, an oily cream, which has a higher um, a grease content to it. And then at the other end, an ointment, so something very greasy and heavy. As you go down this list, things become more greasy and because there's less water content, they tend to need fewer preservatives. They tend to be more effective moisturizers if your child has got very dry skin. However, people will find that things like ointments are a bit heavier on the skin and don't feel so nice and often they're a bit more uh, fiddly to put on properly. And so it tends, it tends to be that creams and lotions might be cosmetically more acceptable. And it's a question of finding out what the family, what the child like, 
because unless they like the consistency and it's doing its job properly, they're basically not going to use it. So there's really no such thing as the right emollient. It's really down to what they'll choose. There's no point in having the best emollient in the world if it's just going to sit there and not be used. And the other thing is you might need to have a variety of different emollients for, for different body sites. Sometimes children will find that something very greasy like ointments on their hands is difficult because it makes it difficult to hold a pencil or to write or to play with their toys. And it may be that using something lighter and more creamy during the day works better for them. And then at bedtime, you can put something a bit heavier and a bit more greasy on. The other thing that's important to recognize is that you do need adequate quantities. So often a child with extensive eczema will need 250 to 500 grams of emollient per week. And 500 grams is quite a big pot that they will get through if they're using it properly. And they can use it as many times during the day as they like. There's no overdosing on your emollients. If the skin is dry, you can put some more on. Now, sometimes when you have big tubs of, of emollient, it's very important. There are two golden rules that I will always tell the parents of, of children with eczema uh, when they're using something like that. The first one is to never put your fingers in the pot, because if you put your fingers in the pot, and then you rub it on the child and you go back to get some more, you're going to introduce bacteria into that emollient. And even though it looks like a very bland, inert thing, bacteria can grow. So the next day when you come to put the ointment or the cream on, you're putting on a sort of nice emulsion of, of bugs uh, that have been growing in your emollient. The second important thing about putting emollients on is to always go downwards in strokes in the direction of the hair growth. If you go round and round in circles, you can clog up the hair follicles and that can also lead to an infection. So topical steroids, the evidence really is that once a day is as good as twice a day. So in most instances, we'll just rec recommend using a topical steroid at the end of the day. So to apply the emollient first of all, and usually let that soak in for 10 to 15 minutes and then apply the topical steroid. And you just want to apply that to the red inflamed areas. So whereas your emollient will go all over, after 10 to 15 minutes, you just come back and target those red areas. Um, and generally speaking, we prefer to use ointments than creams. There are fewer preservatives and they tend to work a bit better. It's really good when you're taking a history from somebody about their eczema or any inflammatory skin disease to try and work out how much topical steroid they're using. So asking how long does a 30 gram tube or a 100 gram tube of, of cream or ointment last you gives you a good idea about how much they're using. Because sometimes parents will say we're using the steroid every day. How long does 30 grams last? Oh, it lasts six months. Well, that's not using adequate amounts. And in terms of how much to use, the advice really is to use it so it's a glistening layer so you can tell that you've been there but if you want to quantify that if you squeeze your topical steroid over the last um, uh, phalanx of your finger that's called a fingertip unit and that is sufficient topical steroid to cover that much surface area of skin so that gives you a good idea if you use it in that kind of quantity you'll see it does really make a really nice glistening layer of skin Sometimes parents will take a teeny weeny amount of topical steroid and spread it over a large area, which just dilutes it and is not going to do its work in that way. So better to use the correct amount, it will switch the eczema off more quickly and then you can step down in how you use it. You want to be using the lowest effective potency, but if you need something potent, just short term to switch the eczema off, that's okay. And there are different potencies. So a mild topical steroid, something you might use on mild sort of baby eczema would be something like 1% hydrocortisone. Moderate strength, one step up, clobetasone butyrate. A potent steroid, something like betamethasone valerate or mometasone uh, is very helpful for sort of thicker areas of eczema, particularly like those discoid patches that I showed you. And sometimes, for example, with hand and foot eczema, where the skin is very, very inflamed, you might need to use a very potent steroid like clobetasol propionate. The topical calcium urine inhibitors are great for childhood eczema. These are licensed for um, children above the age of two, so tacrolimus ointment or pimecrolimus cream. And they're very helpful second line treatments for more severe eczema. Um, but they can be very useful longer term because they're not topical steroids and you're not going to run into problems 
potentially a thinning of the skin uh, and other side effects, they're very, very useful for longer term management of difficult facial eczema. Rather than once a day, like you would with a topical steroid, these do need to be twice a day. And one of the things to warn people about is that an itching or burning sensation is very common, particularly with tacrolimus, but it's entirely normal and the, and the child does get used to that after a period, it stops being a problem. And sun avoidance is recommended because they are immune suppressing in the skin, so there's a theoretical risk, an increased risk of skin malignancy. So I'm going to move away from uh, eczema now to some skin infections. So these are very, very common. And impetigo is something that we see a lot in children, and especially children when they're sort of three, four, five years old, because they do a lot of cuddling of each other and it can spread from, from contact. And this is usually caused by Staphylococcus aureus or sometimes a, a group A beta hemolytic strep. Um, sometimes you can get impetigenization of other diseases, so you can get it on top of things like eczema. And if it's a recurrent problem, you always have to think about whether the child is carrying the staph aureus up their nose and do a little swab and treat it if, if that's found there. And there are two main types of impetigo we see in the skin uh, in children. So there's impetigo contagiosa, that's a common type. And then there is a bullous form as well. So impetigo contagiosa is this kind of appearance. So it starts as little red areas on the skin, often around the face. They become a little bit weepy, uh, vesicular, pustular, and they develop this typical honey kind of crust uh, once they're sort of drying up. And that's intensely uh, infectious. So, you know, direct contact of children are touching their faces and then touching other children, it can spread. So often you'll see it in, in siblings within a family that it's spread around. Sometimes their parents may have little patchy, patches of it as well. Mm -hmm. As I said, you can get impetigenization of other conditions. So this is eczema, which has secondary infection with staph usually, and you get that weepy kind of honey crust. So you would need to address that and, and treat it. Now, bullous impetigo has a slightly different appearance. Um, it often affects the face, like um, the other type of impetigo contagiosa, often you can get it in the flexures and on the limbs and again it starts as little red patches but these develop into more bullous blistery lesions and often they have this characteristic morphology which is slightly annular or ring shaped and if you were to swab these patches you would find staph aureus in almost all cases and the reason that it's blistery is that these bacteria secrete a little exotoxin so in that patch where they're growing, they secrete a toxin that targets a thing called desmoglyin 1. And desmoglyin 1 is one of the important proteins in the epidermis of the skin that helps anchor those cells together. So if you've got an exotoxin targeting that, it causes the cells to fall apart. And what you see macroscopically uh, is a blister. These are some more examples. So you can see it looks quite flexural in, in terms of where it is. And then you've got that typical sort of annular appearance that can, can coalesce like we see on the right. In terms of treating, it's important to use antimicrobials to wash with. Dermal is a preparation which um, contains um, benzalkonium chloride and chlorhexidine. You may find other antimicrobials, you might uh, chlorhexidine wash on its own, can be very helpful just to reduce the bacteria on the skin. You may need uh, topical antibiotics, for example, fusidic acid or mupiracin, uh, if particularly if it's a resistant staph. If it's not settling down with topical measures, sometimes you might need to think about giving antibiotics by mouth, particularly if it's quite an extensive problem. <coughs> now, folliculitis is uh, another common uh, skin infection that people can get. It can either be quite superficial or sometimes you can get deeper lesions in the skin. And the hallmark feature is around the hair follicles, you get little pustules uh, often associated with some erythema around them. Now the causative organisms are usually staph or strep and the child may again, if it's a recurrent problem, have carriage of, of staph in their uh, nasal passages. So you need to think about that. Sometimes you can get slightly different types of folliculitis. So pseudomonas folliculitis is a rather odd entity. It's most commonly seen actually with, with hot tubs that you can get a really inflammatory uh, kind of folliculitis. Or pterosporum, so a yeast-based um, folliculitis. And there the pustules tend to be quite tiny and not as inflammatory as they would be, for example, with a staph or a strep folliculitis. <coughs> 
treatment. If you can manage to treat it topically, that's great. Something topical like fusidic acid or mupiracin. But if it's a deeper infection, it's more widespread, you may need to think about oral antibiotics. And again, if you think that it's nasal carriage or you can demonstrate that it's nasal carriage, you would need to treat that with specific antimicrobial ointment to the nose. Cellulitis is something we don't see as commonly in children as we might do in older people, but it can occur. So this is like a soft tissue uh, infection in the, in the dermis and the subcutis. Again, most commonly staph or strep and often from a little breach or a cut in the skin that allows the bacteria uh, to enter. And here the skin will be very hot, red, sore to touch, swollen, and you might have some tracking uh, of redness up the limbs, uh, indicating lymphangitis, the lymph nodes will be enlarged. If it becomes very swollen, you might get some blistering, and usually the child will be cranky, unwell, they might have systemic upset and fever. And uh, with milder forms, oral antibiotics might be adequate to treat it, usually flucloxacillin, or if there's a problem with that, erythromycin. Um, in immunocompromised individuals, you might need to have a broader spectrum antibiotic. But if they're very young or they're systemically unwell, they might need intravenous antibiotics. Now, I realise I should be covering some emergencies and the things I've spoken about before have, have not been so much of an emergency, but this is a condition that's important to recognise, um, and that is staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. So this is something that we see mostly in infants uh, and in early childhood. Um, it can occur in older people, but it's predominantly something that you would see in young, um, young babies and children. And importantly here, the child will be unwell, they'll be off the feeds, they'll have a temperature, they'll be in pain, very uncomfortable. And it usually starts in the flexures, so as we can see here, with some redness, some flaccid blisters, and the roof comes off those blisters because they're so superficial and leave behind these eroded areas. And you will often have what's called a positive Nikolsky sign. And that means that if you were to rub just adjacent to the, um, the eroded area, actually the epidermis would lift off. So it just shows this incipient separation of the epidermis at that point. Um, and what happens if this isn't recognized and it isn't treated is that those areas of desquamation spread and become very widespread. So these are two babies with much more extensive changes. On the left, we can see this child's lot, lost a lot of areas around their, their tummy, on their uh, hands and feet. And on the right, you can see this is a child that's in, in great distress and they've lost a lot of the skin um, around their limbs and around the genital area. Um, and they seem to be in a lot of pain. Uh, and here you can see they've also got an eroded, sort of in, inflamed, weepy, umbilical stump. This was a, a newborn. Now, when we talked about bullus in Patiga, we were talking about um, strains of staphylococci usually that secrete, secrete a little toxin that just works locally where that infection is. Staph scalded skin is also caused by an exotoxin that's secreted by particular strains, usually of, of staphylococci. But instead of working locally where that infection is, it spreads throughout the body. So it's a more systemic toxin effect, targeting again desmoglion ones, the same target, but going throughout the body. Now the significance of that is that if you were to swab a site that's affected, like for example, the groin crease in that first case, you wouldn't expect to identify the uh, causative bacteria there. It could be somewhere else. Now, in this case, we can see here that it's likely to be the umbilical st stump, but often it's not obvious. So you need to swab the conjunctiva, the baby's throat. You might need in a neonate to swab the mother to try and identify um, the bacteria, but it's not in lesional sites because it's a systemic toxin. The treatment is with usually an IV antibiotics, emollients, analgesia, because this is an incredibly painful um, a condition for babies and, and children are affected, you might want to use some gentle specialised dressings. But really importantly, if it's they're very extensive, that baby's skin isn't able to do all the normal jobs that our skin does, for example, uh, managing temperature regulation, managing fluid balance. So they need a lot of uh, supportive care. Um, and in extensive cases, they'll need very intensive care. 
uh, on a neonatal intensive care unit or a paediatric intensive care unit. And even with the right treatment for this condition picked up and treated, there is a significant mortality associated with it. So if you see a child who's unwell, has red areas, starting the flexures, an extensive uh, desquamation, think about staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. We move now to the more common things that we see in children and here thinking about tinea, so a localized cutaneous fungal infection, sometimes called ringworm. And you can see why, because you've got these round areas that typically grow and expand out with a scaly edge to them. Um, and this often causes a bit of confusion because it looks a bit like discoid eczema that we've seen already. This tends to be more scaly and not as weepy um, and it doesn't respond um, to topical steroids. Um, tinea pedis is where it affects the feet and typically uh, you can get some peeling and flaking in the toe webs that can become more extensive over time. You can get the same kind of appearances on the hands as well. And usually just topical antifungals, things like clotrimazole or tobinafine will be adequate to, to switch that off. The tinea capitis is where it affects the scalp. Um, and this is a really important condition to recognize. Um, you will get little patches, sometimes individual patches, sometimes multiple patches of hair loss in the scalp, often round or oval. And the important thing here is that you often get scaling. You would usually get scaling to a greater or lesser extent associated with that. And these patches will grow uh, gradually over time. You often get lymphadenopathy. You can see in the middle case at the, at the, in, at the bottom, a little lymph node there. So that's very, very typical for tinea capitis. And sometimes you can get more generalized eczematous eruption secondary uh, to that ringworm infection that's something called an id reaction. Now, importantly, to treat tinea capitis, you need to give oral treatment. Topical treatment won't clear it because it's deep within the hair shafts and, and um, so it's a much deeper seated infection. So just something onto the skin isn't going to clear it. You can use ketoconazole shampoo, which will limit the amount of spread that you get. Because again, this is another condition that often spreads between siblings or close contacts um, uh, of the children. So you need to think about it and check uh, whether any other siblings are affected as well and treat them if they are. Now, sometimes your tinea capitis can progress on to this entity. This is called a carrion, and it's where that fungal infection has really got established deep down in the scalp. And it causes these big, tender, boggy swellings, which are studded with lots of pustules. They're a really unpleasant condition for children. And again, very marked lymphadenopathy associated with this. And the treatment really is the same. Some would advocate if you've got a lot of inflammation going on, sometimes using some oral steroids at the same time that you're treating them uh, can help reduce the swelling and, and make it settle down more quickly for the child. Fungal nail infections are uh, probably much more common in adults than they are in children, but it's something that we definitely see. So if you see a few nails affected one or a few uh, nails affected that are thickened, crumbly, discolored, always think about tinea. If you're able to send clippings, that's really helpful to confirm that. And again, usually the treatment needs to be oral uh, with tobinafine or itraconazole, which may need to be given uh, for sort of two to three months, uh, depending on fingernails or toenails, uh, just to allow them to grow out. Um, so uh, usually oral treatment, except for there's a variety of superficial white um, uh, fungal infection that you get in the nails, which, which can respond to topical antifungals. Now this is a condition called tinea incognito that we see sometimes. And this is where tinea has been uh, incorrectly diagnosed usually as eczema or some other inflammatory condition. So they've been treated with topical steroids, which suppresses the appearance of the rash for a while. But as soon as you stop it, it then comes back. So sometimes you see slightly bizarre, partially cleared um, eruptions on the skin that they come back. So if you've got a patch of eczema, but it's not really responding to treatment, you think it looks a bit weird. Think about whether it could be tinea and if you're able to take any scrapings to look for the fungus that's really helpful um, because the treatment is with antifungals not with topical steroids. The scabies is a, a massively important um, uh, skin infestation rather than an infection uh, worldwide and is very prevalent particularly in children and so the scabies mite burrows under the skin 
crawls along laying a few eggs each day the females uh, mites do and pooing as they go along in the skin and it's actually the, the host's reaction to the feces in the skin that causes the rash and the itch and the itch is particularly uh, intense and troublesome. Now often it starts in the finger webs and toe webs and becomes more widespread and particularly in infants what you find is a lot of palmer and planter involvement, little papules and pustules and also in infants unlike older children or adults it usually affects the head and neck as well. Now, for some reason that the, the, the individual is immunocompromised, you can go on and develop a really, really extreme form of, of scabies called crusted scabies, where you get a lot of hyperkeratosis and the skin is just full of, um, of scabies mites because the body isn't able to clear them and the host's not, not managing to clear them um, at all. So it can become uh, much more of a problem and can become very, very infectious. Now, it is an infectious thing, so close contact will mean this is spread. Um, different individuals in a household may show signs of scabies to a different extent, so it's really important to treat everybody in the house if you suspect scabies. And usually we'd give some permethrin cream and apply it for 12 hours or, or 24 hours and then wash it off um, and then reapply one week later to the whole household. Um, if you have unresponsive disease, severe disease, crusted disease, then ivermectin orally can be very helpful. And these are just some pictures showing the changes that you get in, in little children with a lot of uh, hand and foot uh, involvement, with those papules and sometimes pustules on the palms and soles. Eczema hepaticum uh, is an infection that's an important one to recognise. So I put this here under my sort of dermatology emergencies in children. And this is where a child has a background of atopic dermatitis, but they get a, an infection with herpes simplex or reactivation of herpes simplex in their areas of eczema. And the, the typical hallmark features of this, you can see here in these cases, is very monomorphic. All these little areas look the same, little punched out round ulcers that are a few millimeters across. And it can be quite localized or it can become much more generalized. And um, in more severe cases, children will be very unwell or have a temperature, it'll be very painful. Uh, and you, you will really worry when you get lesions around the eye that you may get involvement in the eyes. They may need to be checked by the ophthalmologist. Treatment would be with antiviral, so acyclovir usually orally or in a severe case intravenously. And once they're on treatment and things are settling, make sure you treat the underlying eczema because it's that sort of barrier dysfunction that's allowing the herpes to spread. And also if you've got itchy eczema, the child will be scratching and that would also be spreading the virus. I'm including just a couple of conditions that are quite common uh, in children here under the autoimmune banner. So vitiligo is very common. We know vitiligo affects around 1% of people and in half of those, it starts in childhood. There is a segmental form where you get a sort of localized area of vitiligo on, a, on part of the body, but more typically people will get classical uh, vitiligo, which tends to be very symmetrical it likes around the orifices, so around the ears, around the eyes, around the mouth, around the genital area, um, and symmetrically often sites of trauma, so the daughter of the hands or the feet, knees and elbows in particular. And treatment-wise, potent topical steroid would usually be the first approach, or tacrolimus. I think tacrolimus is, is as good in my experience. You need to be careful to apply sunscreen. Those patches of pale skin can't protect themselves from the sun or, and are therefore prone to burning very easily. Now, sometimes if topical measures haven't worked um, and if it's quite extensive, you might think about having light therapy. And sometimes very uncommonly in children, but sometimes in adults that have very extensive vitiligo, you can actually depigment any residual patches so that the skin is the even uh, depigmented color all over, which can be cosmetically less um, disturbing for people. Alopecia areata is another very common condition that we see in our paediatric clinics. So patchy hair loss, unlike the tinea, this isn't scaly, there's no scale at all. Um, and it usually affects the scalp, but it might affect other areas, for example, the eyebrows or the eyelashes. And the treatment would be with potent topical steroids. Um, uh, usually in older children that could tolerate intralesional steroid injections, that would be another option. And then one of the hallmark features you see, uh, if you look with a dermatoscope, look under a lens, you can see these exclamation mark hairs. So often around the edges of the patches of alopecia, you can see what would seem to be little broken hairs, but they're slightly broader 
at the free end and narrow down as they enter into the scalp. I'm just gonna sort of move now um, to finish off with some, some birthmarks um, that children get. So this is something that as pediatric dermatologists would see, but you wouldn't see these entities usually in uh, adults, or at least not presenting and needing diagnosis. So a variety of different types of vascular birthmark, and this is uh, a very common one. This is an infantile hemangioma. And this affects around 10% of babies, commonly on the head and neck, but they can occur anywhere on the body. Often they're not noticeable at birth or they're just a little paler area in the skin, but they go through a proliferative phase where they become red and raised, very livid, like the one on the forehead we can see here, um, usually over the first sort of four to six months of life. Then what they do is they sit there and after a period they involute, so they become a bit flatter, a bit softer and the colour changes. So you can see at the top, this is an involuting infantile hemangioma, so that bright livid red colour is being replaced by a more sort of greyy, mauvey kind of colour and it's flattening down. <clears throat> Sorry. Now, Sometimes you get hemangiomas that are in difficult sites, and um, these are ones that we might now like to treat with propranolol. It was discovered a number of years ago now that beta blockers can be enormously effective to stop the proliferative phase of these hemangiomas and push them into an involution kind of phase much earlier. So when I sort of say complicated hemangiomas, these are some examples here. So hemangiomas around the uh, nappy area commonly ulcerate, which is extremely painful. It's a really difficult condition. Previously, all we could do was, was offer laser treatment. Now we might still laser them to try and get them to, to uh, heal up more quickly. But propranolol would be something that you would want to give for a complicated hemangioma at that site with ulceration. Here's a child um, uh, next to that with a large, uh, periocular hemangioma, and that's going to stop the eye from being able to open. And if infants aren't able to use both eyes together, you can actually lose the vision. The, the, the pathways, the visual pathways don't develop properly if you, if you have occluded vision from, from that affected eye. And so you really want to get on and treat that as an emergency with propranolol to help that involute, to encourage the eye to be able to open and, and the vision to develop normally. Infantile hemangiomas on the lip can also be a big problem. They can ulcerate and they can interfere with feeding. And often hemangiomas that are around the beard area can be associated with hemangiomas around the airway. So some children will have respiratory problems as well. This is an example where you need to use propranolol. On the left, we've got a child who's got multiple small hemangiomas. And we know that if you have multiple hemangiomas on the skin, Clinically, we usually go by five or more. You would want to look to see if there's any internal um, evidence of hemangiomas, particularly in the liver that can cause problems uh, with the circulation and can cause heart failure uh, in extreme cases because of shunting, because of the, the, the volume of hemangioma that's present there. So in these kind of complicated cases, you would want to think about giving propranolol as soon as possible. And usually once you've started giving it, you would need to carry on for about 12 months to be sure that you're not gonna get rebound when you stop giving it. So during the potential for proliferation, during that phase, giving propranolol to settle them down. And you get very, very uh, swift responses to the introduction of beta blockers. Usually within a, a week or two, you can see significant improvement. Sometimes you see less critical, more superficial hemangiomas, for example, large ones on the face that you don't want to allow to sort of grow and cause um, tissue stretching. Uh, once they've involuted, you might have a cosmetic problem. And using topical beta blockers in the form of timolol can be extremely helpful in that kind of situation. Generally, propranolol is very safe and well tolerated. You do need to be careful, particularly in premature babies, that they uh, are feeding well, you, so there is a risk of um, hypoglycemia, you worry slightly about uh, an increased risk of uh, wheezing and asthma in some children, and beta blockers uh, systemically can sometimes cause some sleep disturbance, but generally speaking extremely well tolerated and a fantastic treatment for complicated infantile hemangiomas. Now, this is a very common condition, this is called nevus simplex or sometimes called a salmon patch or a stalk mark. 
And these are very common in babies, often over the back of the neck, as you can see here. Sometimes you get it over the glabella and on the upper eyelids. It's poorly defined, pale pink. If the baby's crying or if they're having a bath and the skin warms up, they become more noticeable. The ones on the face generally clear in the first year or two of life. And a lot of the neck ones will persist. So sometimes you see adults that still have persistence of that nevus simplex over the back of the neck, but it has no underlying sort of significance or concerns at all. These are port wine stains, which are slightly different. They're much less common and they can occur anywhere on the body. Um, unlike the salmon mark or stalk, uh, stalk marks or the salmon patches, they tend to be slightly deeper in color and have more clearly well-defined edges and they are persistent. Sometimes they will tend to lighten a bit over time. Sometimes they'll become a bit darker and even a bit lumpy over time. Usually they're not of any significance other than the cosmetic appearance, but sometimes in certain situations, you do need to just think about whether there could be other associations. So Sturge Weber syndrome is where you can get intracranial uh, collections of blood vessels as well, which can cause problems, for example, with epilepsy or learning, dis learning um, you know, disorders. And then in that kind of situation, you might want to do some imaging with an MRI scan or an MR angiogram. And very importantly, when you've got a port wine stain around the eye area to get ophthalmology review because there is a risk of glaucoma. And that risk of glaucoma may not be present in the first few years of life, but can be something that comes on during life. So ophthalmology follow up to check the ocular pressures is really important there. Now, sometimes you can consider laser treatment to lighten the, the vascular um, component, but there's a lot of controversy about the timing of treatment. Um, Generally speaking, we'd not do that in small infants because it requires a general anaesthetic to be repeated every time they have a treatment. They often have a course of treatment to, to lighten it. And we know that that, that color can come back um, over time. So it's really a question of, of timing of treatment if laser is indicated. Dermal melanocytosis is a very, very common treatment. We've got a uh, very common condition. We've got a couple of examples here where you get these bluey gray macular areas in the skin, particularly in darker skin types, uh, lower back, bottom, um, and over the shoulders. And they gradually fade uh, in early childhood. So nothing to worry about, and a, a normal variant, really. Congenital melanocytic nevi are like moles that children are born with, and the majority of them are small, but sometimes they're larger, and they're classified as to small, medium, large, or giant. And sometimes they're multiple with lots of satellite lesions, so multiple lesions coming. And they don't tend to become proportionately bigger over time, but they do grow as the child grows. And over time, they can become a bit raised, a bit bumpy and a bit hairy. But also we know that sometimes they can just spontaneously fade over time. Now, people are concerned when they, particularly when you get large or uh, ones with satellites, about the possible risk of having neurocutaneous melanosis. And that's where you get involvement with the same kind of deposition of melanocytes within the, the central nervous system. The risk of melanoma overall uh, developing within these areas is very, very small, probably higher uh, with the giant lesions. In terms of the risk of neurocutaneous melanosis, it seems to be when you've got multiple satellite lesions rather than just the size of a single giant, it's more the, the number of, of uh, uh, individual satellite ones that you have that seems to confer that risk. So it would be important if you've got multiple CMNs to do some imaging of the brain and the spinal cord with an MRI. In terms of cosmetic concerns, sometimes it's possible to excise these, particularly if they're on the, on the face and very noticeable. Uh, in the past, people have done very dramatic uh, procedures on, on babies with extensive uh, curatage and so on, we wouldn't tend to recommend that. The, the, the risk of having multiple surgeries to do that um, is not inconsiderable. And often the cosmetic results you get with the, the scarring associated with it can be uh, quite disfiguring. And often, as I said, these can fade significantly over time. So we've talked about um, some of the more common things that uh, can occur in uh, paediatric dermatology uh, and a few emergencies there are things to be aware of as, as sort of red flags um, that might need more sort of urgent treatment. Um, 
So I realized I just sort of picked on a few things there. There's lots of other things that present in children, um, but I'm really happy to take any questions um, that any of you have about what we've talked about or for the other sort of uh, pediatric uh, skin conditions uh, that you want to um, ask about. Very happy here for you. Gemma, that was fabulous. Thank you so much. And uh, you probably see that loads of questions have been coming through the chat box. So I've been um, trying to address uh, most of them. But if you don't mind, what I might do is actually go back and, and see uh, uh, which ones I, um, I could uh, pass them on to you, if you don't mind. So, yeah, please do. Yes. So the first question, uh, going back now from Han, was about post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation in eczema, of course, particularly for uh, darker skin types. Can that be cured? And if so, how long does it take to be cured was the question. Yeah, so there's no specific treatment for it, um, but it does improve on its own, but it can take months and months. Really, I think the focus has to be on treating any active areas of eczema that are coming up, because if you treat the eczema effectively, as soon as possible, you're not allowing that skin to become so inflamed that it leaves behind the hyperpigmentation. So just getting on and getting the, the eczema treated is what you should be aiming for. Don't worry about the pigmentation, although it can hang around for months, depending on how intense it is, it will settle down. Thank you, Gemma. So um, another question was about scabies. So why um, scabies often start in finger and toe webs? That's a really good question. I'm not sure I know the answer to that, um, whether it's where this, whether it's a site that naturally you might, where the skin's quite thin, that you might um, get more exposure to it. It's easier for the mites to burrow where the, the skin is thin. Um, whether it's just an area that, particularly on the hands, you can get to and you can scratch and it'd be more noticeable. I'm not entirely sure. I don't know if anyone else knows. Chris is on the call. Chris is very clever. Maybe he knows. <laughs> Professor Griffiths. Maybe he knows, he's just not telling us. <laughs> Maybe he's not, uh, I don't know whether he's able to unmute himself, but um, yeah, um, what, I'll, what I might do is actually, uh, if he does come on, then of course we'll, we'll pause. But the next question is about um where are we oh permethrin oh so yes somebody asked about a good dermatology book to study so i provided the um, bad handbook for medical students and also rook's handbook of dermatology but if there's any specific pediatric dermatology books that you might recommend uh, Gemma. yeah so there are there are a couple of, of big tomes so there's the so-called harper textbook of uh, pediatric dermatology it's too big thick weighty um, tomes, um, which is is a good one, um, and then the American one, the Shackner and Hansen textbook of pediatric dermatology is good too. It's, it's again, it's a big um, reference book. I would say out of the two, the Shackner and Hansen is slightly visually more exciting, um, but they're both good and very comprehensive. If you wanted a, a, a text, but brilliant. Thank you. What I'll do is I'll um, put in a link later on. Um, and then another question, good question, uh, is about hum infantile hemangioma. So is there any alternative treatment for uh, infantile hemangioma if the child has contraindication for beta blocker? Like yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty unusual, actually, to not be able to give a beta blocker. Um, so if a child had asthma, making sure that the asthma is optimally treated. Um, if a child, uh, if, if they're premature, you're worried about um, hypoglycemia, what we'd normally recommend is uh, if they're off their feeds, if they're not well, just to omit the beta blocker for a few days until they're back and they're feeding properly. Um, so there are actually very few indication, uh, contraindication, ab absolute uh, contraindications. And the treatments that we had before beta blockers were known about would be uh, systemic corticosteroids um, and in some cases things like vinblastine. But I think you'd, you'd really want to shy away and try your best to be able to find some form of beta blocker that you could get in most cases you can. Yeah, 
Thank you, Gemma. So another bit about, um, another question about port wine staying. Why is laser used in port wine staying? Or I, I thought that they meant which laser, which we passed by, but uh, no. So yes, so what you'd use is a, a vascular laser, so something like a pulse dye laser, and that has a particular wavelength of uh, laser uh, light that is selectively taken up by the hemoglobin in the red blood cell. So if you've got a red birthmark that's got blood in it, making it pink, using the pulse dye laser, the energy gets taken up by the uh, red blood cells in the port wine stain and that sort of heat shrinks those blood vessels, so it shrinks them down and the skin looks paler. Um, so over a, a course of treatments, you're just selectively targeting those little blood vessels and they shrink down and become paler, but they can recur over time. So that's why you want to get the timing right because you don't want to put a, a small child through lots of general anesthetics to treat something. And then by the time they're sort of eight, nine, 10, it's all coming back again. You're mm -hmm. gonna to have to repeat it again. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Gemma, for that. And um, I think probably uh, just a couple more questions. So how do you excise congenital melanocytic mulus? Um, it really depends how big they are and where they are. Um, so oftentimes you, you want to excise them if they're somewhere that's you know, making a visible difference for that child. So say if you had something on the forehead that was a sort of reasonable size, you might want to ask um, for excision. Um, and there are two main ways that, that can be done for the sort of head and, the, and the, the, the face. So one way on this, on the scalp or on the forehead would be to use a tissue expander. That's like a little balloon that gets surgically implanted under the skin of normal adjacent skin. And over time that can be inflated with water injections to expand the balloon. So you get an, an area of adjacent skin that is stretched. Often that takes months to do that. But then when you remove the birthmark, you've got enough spare skin to be able to, to pull it across and close that defect. The other way that it can be done is through something called serial re-excision. So that's where you might take a little bit of the birthmark out, but there's enough stretch in the skin to be able to bring the edges together. After a period where the skin is healed and it's sort of stretched, you can remove another bit of it and bring it together again. So it can just be something that's removed in stages just by being able to close the skin. So those would be the main ways. Um, in other sites, it, it might depend whether you could sort of do a flap or something surgical that way. Um, but large giant ones, it's not, feasible to be able to remove it all some of those pictures I, I showed of the ones over the sacrum you wouldn't be able to remove those mm. no absolutely Gemma I still recall to this date when I first started as the uh, you know uh, clinical fellow in um, uh, pediatrics dermatology back in 2017 one of the first patients I saw was a young girl from Spain and she had multiple surgeries to her CMN on the back it was really huge and what, what ended up happening was she was just left with this awful scar um, and of course that that wound got infected so I think uh, you probably would recall the girl she was mm. such a bright you know smart girl but yeah tra tragic case so essentially it's just really important I guess to re-emphasize what Professor Malario said about not to excise the large ones or MDT discussions uh, yeah. needed in these cases and so, you know when when a, when a baby presents with a large cmn you know what your responsibility is to sort of educate the parents about what is going to be feasible yeah. what isn't going to be feasible what you're going to aim for you know yeah. it's managing expectations early on really absolutely so um actually that was the last question but just to say that uh, professor chris griffiths did message in the chat box saying that he was you know, unable to unmute <laughs> But he was unable to unmute, but he agrees with Professor Malaria's answer to scabies um, starting in the finger and toe webs. Okay. Um, Gemma, there are so many amazing you know, complimentary messages. So, and I think I mentioned to you that last Sunday we had 38 max and today 118. So wow. I think, you know, it, it means that Professor Griffiths, you did a fabulous job last weekend that, you know, the news must have spread and everybody found today really, really very useful and a lot of compliments. So 
thank you so much for giving up your time. Uh, Gemma, just a quick question about, you know, I, I'm aware that there are you know, some patient images, but it's highly valuable for, for students to actually watch the lecture back and learn from it. Would you be happy with that? Yeah, I would. Thank you so much, Gemma. Actually, that, that's it, really. We covered all the questions. And um, thank you so much once again for your time, Gemma, and your yeah. fabulous talk. My absolute pleasure. Anytime. All right. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, see you next Saturday uh, back with Professor Chris Griffiths on case-based discussions. And then on Sunday next week, um, the two nurses, specialist nurses, will go through practical tips on how to use topicals, dressings, and so on. So see you next weekend. Have a good week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.